Well, welcome everybody to uh, Black History Lunchtime Conversations. This is uh, the 38th session. We started last October. Um, a number of us were in lockdown at that stage. <coughs> I'm in Australia and I'm still in lockdown. Well, another short, sharp lockdown now, but uh, an amazing achievement. And very many thanks to everyone who has supported us over that time. We've had the most brilliant presentations from authors, from academics, from community researchers, um, from uh, creative artists, uh, the list goes on and on. And uh, are really, we're very grateful. And special big thank you to Simon Fringo from Belong Nottingham, who's been uh, a partner in, in this plotting and planning each week and thinking what else we can do um, and dealing with all the technology and also David Alston sends his apologies but from uh, from Scotland he's been a great support to us as well so it's just been been remarkable and after this 38th session we're going to take a break but I'm going to keep in touch with people because it's winter time here I'm in lockdown. I need company, so um, I'll be uh, uh, contacting anybody who's who's interested. But I know you've all got holidays and wonderful things like that to look forward to. So all the very best to you all. Now we've got uh, brilliant speakers uh, uh, today. Um, uh, the Jamaican High Commissioner, uh, His Excellency Seth George Ramakan, is going to um, join us more formally when he gets to his venue um, and will uh, uh, bring us up to date with his presentation. So we thought that um, we'd start with uh, Professor Charlotte Williams, um, who's going to be telling us about developments in Wales, which are leading, very excitingly, leading to Black history being introduced as an integral part of the curriculum in Wales. And it's, uh, it's lovely to see you, Charlotte, in Wales. And it was also lovely to be able to chat to you when you were here in Adelaide for quite a few months during that long lockdown time. So Charlotte, I think you're going to share your screen and then after Charlotte's presentation, um, if it's convenient, we'll then uh, um, speak with uh, the Jamaican High Commissioner. And then we've got Professor Robert Burroughs, who's going to be talking to us about a project that a number of us were involved in, in, um, in North Wales, which is exciting to uh, hear about the uh, students who attended the um, African Institute. So Charlotte, are you okay then to share your screen? And Yes, yes, have... thank you. And um, thank you for having me. And it's really great um, to have the opportunity to boast a little bit about what we're doing in Wales. Um, so I will, I will just share the screen. And here we go. I think what happens is that it's um, difficult to get into the control bar once you share. Yes, yes there's the... Um, it kind the, of the hidden, comes so across I'm, the top of the screen, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm trying to look to see if I can get the um, from the beginning. Mm. I can, I, can't, see your, I, I can have... see your control bar where you have you the slide. Uh, but unfortunately, because no, I don't have the presentation on this side. Um... What happens is the. Um, I'm, oh, hang on. There we oh, are. Right. Yeah. What's that? There we are. Oh, wonderful. That's great. Well yeah. done. Well. Lovely. Good day. Well, yes, thank you, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to um, share the, the work that we've been doing in uh, Wales. And um, many of you will know, because I can see that um, some of you are from Wales, that this work that um, I was leading in relation to the curriculum falls in place with a number of developments that are going on in Wales following the Black Lives Matter campaign and a lot of grassroots activity and work that's been going on for a long time, pushing for change. And in the broader scene, 
Um, we've got the government has published its Raise Equality Action Plan and, and it's out for consultation. I think it, the consultation ends today. Um, there have been a number of national organisations that have sort of been gearing up their attention to uh, black and minority perspectives, including the Arts Council and um, uh, Literature Wales and, you know, several of them have got a, a number of initiatives. There's been uh, work, a, a group was convened by the government on um, an audit of public monuments and associated artifacts to do with slavery in Wales, and they've published a report. And there have been a number of initiatives, social policy initiatives, looking at socio-economic disadvantage in Wales, um, the inequality gap in terms of race, and um, this work on the curriculum. So I, I wanted to just sort of place this activity within a, a kind of wider strategy that the government's undertaking to really give a focus to race equality issues um, in Wales. And it's very opportune for us because it means there's a lot of momentum driving forward um, these initiatives. Um, the work, the ministerial group is entitled Communities Contributions and Kinevin, Black, Asian and Minority Ethnicities in the New Curriculum. And the, back, the, the brief background is that the new curriculum is to be launched in 2022. We've heard that because of COVID, there's going to be a delay in the secondary schools um, starting the new curriculum until 23, but the primary schools will take on the new curriculum from 2022. And it was very opportune that this group was set up at that moment because it meant that um, pre rollout of the new curriculum, we could draw attention to the issues of um, black history, um, black perspectives in uh, Welsh history and um, what we would expect in terms of um, teacher development to make this happen. And, and that really was the brief of the group to look at what resources will they need, what kinds of professional development will teachers need if we are to give um, more focused attention to um, these perspectives in the new curriculum. And so, yeah, we started the work uh, last July and we reported this March. And what got me back to Wales was the argument that I wanted to disseminate the um, findings of this report and to be oversee the development of how the, re in, uh, the recommendations would be interpreted. So what we know and what the starting point is was a huge amount of evidence that had been amassed about the Welsh education system. And we've known this for some good while, um, those people who've been advocating for black history for some 13 years as part of um, Race Council Cymru and the Black History Group had pointed for some long time to this uh, fundamental inequality. And there's a known gap in attainment, particularly for black, black Caribbean and mixed race groups. It's been well evidenced for some time. And there's also was a number of reports that talk experientially about how children from our communities were faring in schools and, and their experiences in schools. And work most recently published by the Race Alliance Wales takes this peer, um, peer approach where young people from black backgrounds have interviewed young people from black backgrounds who are in the education system and they've reported um, racisms in schools, continued racism in schools, teacher not, teachers not getting it, et cetera, et cetera. We also had a big piece of work undertaken by the Education Workforce Council that showed how poorly represented um, black and minority people were in the teaching and leadership population of the education workforce. And, you know, it's very unlikely in Wales that you would have a teacher from a black background um, with just some 1% of teachers identifying in this way. So if you think of all the schools and all the school population, it's um, more likely 
that um, they are monocultural, more likely that they would have had um, teachers from um, white backgrounds teaching them, etc. So uh, that's an important point because what we have argued is that this issue impacts and is important for all children in Wales, not only for black and minority ethnic children. Uh, and then it was clear that um, in terms of their equality duties, their mandated duties, schools hadn't, uh, their, in their policies and their practices, hadn't been able to operationalize race equality, make it live in uh, the school atmosphere and in terms of what the schools are doing. And we also spoke with black teachers themselves, that, that minority of teachers that I'm talking about, we spoke with several of them in our focus groups, and we heard how they're overburdened, how the, the, the expectations on them to take forward these issues, but they're not rem remunerated for it or they're not recognized for their, all the extra work they're doing. In addition, we benefited from the fact that the Welsh Centre for Public Policy were doing evidence re reviews, one of which was focused on education. So the point being, there's plenty of evidence to show racial inequality in the system, and there's plenty of evidence that showed the link between a very monocultural and kind of static curriculum and um, issues such as low self-esteem, lack of interest, and school exclusions amongst minority um, groups. The new curriculum actually, and I won't spend a lot of time on this um, uh, slide, the new curriculum does uh, state very clearly in its statutory guidance that one of the purposes of transforming the curriculum is to produce what we call ethical and informed citizens of Wales and the world. So they really want people were knowledgeable about their culture, knowledgeable about the history of Wales, knowledgeable about how black history is part of Welsh history and Welsh history is part of black history, um, and that this, uh, pupils are more equipped for the kind of global interactions and the world in which they will, will operate. And there's clearly strong demographic, statutory, ethical, and a disciplinary case for a focus on, on black history. The demographic one's a bit of a tricky one because uh, people constantly point to the fact that Wales is 95% white, but that isn't the point as we will know. So we um, put out a vision statement and, and basically the vision statement said that we wanted every teacher to feel enabled and supported to take these issues forward, that um, that they would understand how to place the contributions of black and minority peoples within the context of the history of Wales and its development, and that they would understand the origins and manifestations of racism. And that, we argued, would give every learner in Wales the opportunity to be equipped um, and to meet those expectations of the new, of the new curriculum. So I thought it might be just sort of interesting to talk about what some of the issues, the more tricky issues are with this development and um, what we as a working group kind of anticipated might be some of the issues as we want to take forward what are um, uh, some 51 recommendations that we made. And you'll all be aware of the debates around the acronym BAME um, and the sort of uh, rejection of the acronym BAME, which has been used in different ways in uh, political narrative in the UK at the moment. On the one hand, the argument is that there's so much diversity within that acronym, it's useless and we shouldn't use it. Um, and we should be having a sort of more fine tuned response to um, the issues of inequality within uh, black and minority groups. Um, but on the other hand, we've seen in the Sewell report, also recently published in the UK, how that can be used to divide uh, and depoliticize that constituency um, that have mobilized around the uh, term, certainly the term black, but also uh, the term BME. 
But when you talk about the curriculum, we also have to extend that to say, well, whose story is it um, as the Black history movement moves forward very much about um, Black African Caribbean stories, um, AKA slavery and beyond, or is it about all stories of minority ethnic contributions to the development of Wales? In which case, if you look at that third um, point there, Kenevin, we have an issue straight away about the salience of some of these issues in some areas of Wales, where the claim is made that the, in terms of Kenevin, that is the local community, the locality, the, the basis on which we understand ourselves and our place in the world is not particularly diverse. You know, I've heard this uh, as a point of resistance to what we're saying. And, and so we've got a real challenge there in terms of what does, how is black history interpreted? What does it mean? Who owns it? Whose story are we talking about? There's some quite complex issues uh, to think about there. And the second point is that although we've been hailed as, you know, um, the Welsh government have made mandatory black history in the curriculum, and they have, you know, there's no doubt about it. The, the um, statements that underpin, particularly the humanities and arts elements, suggest uh, mandatory inclusion of these issues. The whole curriculum is permissive. That means there is no um, uh, nationally agreed set of literature, set of books, particular resources that a teacher must use. This curriculum relies on the individual teacher building their curriculum, co-producing their curriculum with pupils bottom up. So they, we are reliant on teachers selecting the material, using the material appropriately um, and placing that material in the context of the wider Welsh history or the wider story of Wales and its industrial, economic and social development. And that's a big ask. That's a big ask because we know that our workforce lacks the confidence to do that. And in many cases, the competence uh, to do that. So there's some big challenges in, in that respect. And we're also concerned, obviously, that this isn't, you know, the kind of pop up um, rhetoric that's associated to the currency of Black Lives Matter efforts, but that it will be sustainable. And what will make this effort sustainable and realized, you know, as the years go on and the years to come. Um, some of the things that we found out are quite interesting. It's not that there are no schools in Wales that are addressing these issues and doing it well, there certainly are. But we've, what we noted when we looked at the resources that they used was that it was a rather ad hoc selection of resources. There was no uh, significant or coherent approach to what that body of knowledge might be. And there was, we noted, a what we call a resource bias towards stories of slavery. So some children might report that they had had some input on um, the slave trade and on slavery, uh, but that didn't make them feel particularly good, didn't make them feel good about themselves. And there was no other balanced input that reflected the contributions of um, black people in Wales, past and present. So there's a kind of a skew that was having a is is having a negative impact on um, some of the some children. We also noted that the resources were very poor in several areas of the curriculum, and especially bilingual resources, the availability of bilingual resources. Um, and I've gone on record as saying, you know, these issues are just as important to the maths teacher as they are to the music or history teacher but it's been sort of sidelined within the curriculum into the sort of history of humanities and arts elements rather than more broadly uh, into other elements right across the curriculum, thinking about as, um, you know, um, science, 
maths, um, thinking about languages, etc. And then we noted that there were uh, particular access issues for practitioners. Um, teachers are not researchers. They do need basic material. They do need help and assistance. They do need a resource base. And although there are loads of resources out there, um, navigating them, bringing them together, giving them a context was um, not non-existent. Uh, the good point is that teachers do want help. They do ask for help. They do ask for examples. They do ask for guidance. And, and, and there we are, I've put enthusiasm is high, but confidence and confident, competence is low. A lot of teachers reported fear, feeling fearful, fearful of saying the wrong thing, fear about you know, not getting it right, fear of backlash from and resistance from parents. So there's a, a you know, a big story about um, fear around. Now, um, I, I wanted to say a little bit about this concept of Kinevin because Kinevin drives the new curriculum. And the assumption is that if you understand your own place, your own identity and your own sense of place in the world, you can extend that to understand the identity, place and contribution of others, Wales and beyond. That's the, the principle. So start with your local history, your locality, um, ideas about you know, what has happened that are salient to you and move then forward to the wider story of Wales. Now, what I have been noting and one thing that worries me is that there's a whole plethora of little stories that emerge across Wales. So we might be talking about Jack Stamlin in, in you know, North Wales, um, we might be talking about C Copperopolis in Swansea. You know, there's a whole load of different stories going on. And these um, are being presented as, look, this is as engaging with black history. But my point here is, oh, and I think I can I just have to shut my window. <laughs> I can hear. Sorry about that. And my point here is that if these stories are just nice little interesting stories that are disaggregated, you know, Randolph Turpin, Great Boxer, Clandidno on the Orm. What's that got to do with uh, Wales? What's, how's that located within its industrial, social, cultural and economic development? So I'm a bit worried about that kind of in, in interpretation. Um, I've mentioned the lack of diversity in the school workforce and the significance of that not for the black children, but for the white children is the point there. You know, seeing positive role models, being instructed by a black educator is significant uh, to all. And we've made this point, of course, about uh, needing to embed this in teacher training, initial teacher training and in continuous professional learning. Um, and the point being that we need a whole school approach to these matters that they are not add-on, that they should be embedded in the culture of the school um, in very particular ways. And to do that, each school needs to have stronger engagement with minority communities, organizations, both local, national, virtual, beyond. You know, this is one of the things, uh, advantages or small advantages that we've learned about Zoom is that we can utilize a, a much bigger resource than ever we thought. So last slide, we've hammered home this acronym and um, alliteration. And I use this alliteration because I know the Welsh love alliterations. Leaders, leavers, learners, that it's a combination of factors that's going to make this happen. We need leaders, strong and imaginative leaders. And I don't just mean people in leadership roles, but people who can lead the field are going to be important to this development. We need levers, which are those accountability mechanisms like ESTIN and you know, the regulators and the financial incentives should be there. But we also need learners. And for these issues to advance, we are going to need to create an enabling environment in which people can take risks, they can trial things, 
they can talk about it, they can have a dialogue, they can learn. Um, and that will be staff, that will be students and pupils themselves and as our stakeholders in that process. So there we are. That's uh, the alliteration, leaders, leavers and learners that we hope will make it happen. So thank you for listening to that. And, and, it, and it is a, a wonderful story of good old Wales, progressive yet again. Um, <laughs> but of course, there's a long way to go. Thanks indeed. Wow, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, I'm sure we'd all be giving, uh, applauding. My uh, screen seems to have, uh, um, no, we're okay, I'm back again. All right, fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, Charlotte. That was uh, how you summarised the incredible amount of work that's been put in and the 51, is it, recommendations? Um, <laughs> well done. That's, that's a, an achievement. Um, I wonder if you have any questions uh, right away. Uh, we have been asked if we can have a copy of the slides. Um, and I, I responded to Janet and I said, I know they're already online, aren't they? From other talks that you've given, but um, would it be possible to have a copy of the slides? Yes, you're most welcome to use those. Thank you very much indeed, that would be helpful. And uh, have we any other questions, points, links? John, would you like to ask? Yeah, um, I, I found that very interesting. I think that you covered a lot of ground there, Charlotte. And I mean, you know, what you've brought out there and some of the the problems, I mean, it's certainly reflective of, of our experience uh, over a long period. You know, I'm going back to the 70s, 80s in Birmingham and so on, where um, everything is, uh, we've got people coming in. But of course, we have people like um, our colleagues who were just starting up even as head teachers at that time and um, all the sorts of problems. But the, the big big thing is we had, a, we had a, an interesting discussion amongst our group this week on Tuesday and then I watched um, Prime Minister's Question Time and it could have been a replay of our discussions because it came up from the uh, experience what happened with the England football team and... Um, what happened to uh, the players and so on in that kind of way. And, um, you know, we've got this situation where it looked as if everything has been sorted. You know, <laughs> the, the prime minister was saying, ah, I've done this, that and the other. We're, uh, we're going to make sure that, um, that racists don't get into football. Uh, we've been in touch with the media companies and so on. And I mean, uh, uh, Carlton sent me some shocking examples of stuff that have come up from, what was it, Snapchat, although actually um, uh, Johnson um, actually mentioned that group. So, you know, at least it's, it's, been, it's been mentioned. So we've got this situation, but, you know, we've seen that people face two ways at once and uh, being able to um, put out the sewer report or sewage report as some people call it um you know it, it does show the situation so i think certainly within the decolonization we're paying a lot of tension attention to um right the the, the 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 things but what are the underlying factors that are keeping things the way that they are um but certainly, I think from last week, I've moved quite a bit, even from what Levi was saying, because he said, look, we'd started, uh, we started strongly with Africa and the um, Pan-African movement. But this week, I mean, we're certainly looking, at, as Carlton said, into human resources, and we've got them there. We've got living people that we, we want to support. Um, you know, the footballers that have come forward and some of them have distinguished themselves in all sorts of ways. So, you know, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to say, point out these people, not just people in the past, but even more important. And I think that's going to be our starting point. I think from what Levi said, I, I've certainly changed my, my view from that. And I thank him for his ideas from last week. But thank you, Charlotte. That was great. Thank you very much indeed, John. I think I'll ask Helen now. Uh, thanks very much, Charlotte. Um, I'm a governor in a Welsh primary school. And although I've been aware of you know, the development of the new curriculum, this particular element of it, you know, it's been fascinating to hear from you. 
And I just wonder how, first of all, governors can, you know, also get on board because, I mean, they're crucial in terms of making sure that the curriculum is delivered, but also whether any of, you know, those who are really keen and that can, can get involved in other ways in terms of identifying materials and so on. You know, is there a place for volunteers in this? Well, that's fantastic to hear from you, Helen. And I did meet with the Board of Governors, you know, your kind of overarching body as part of this um, process. And I was really heartened to hear them speak much as you have spoken. What can we do? You know, can you give us some guidance on the kind of questions we can be asking of our schools? Um, can you give us some exemplars and, and so on? So we're sort of really aware that this, as a major stakeholder, the governors are on side. Um, and they're also on side in terms of having greater representation amongst um, governing bodies from minority communities in, in, in different areas and, and the kind of catalyst that might be as well to the development. So one of the recommend, well, several of the recommendations do relate to the, the governors um, and we sort of in, the, in that great civil service way, they, they pass the recommendation, pass the key group first before they're published. So they're not a horrid surprise. So they are things like um, training and development, maybe working with Estin to, to have some sort of similar training on what kinds of prompts and questions that you can ask of your school when you're, um, and, and how the school develops its priorities for the year, you know, the annual school plan, how you can influence that. So yeah, a very, very important stakeholder that you are. Um, and I'm really pleased to hear your enthusiasm for taking this forward because the more we can spread out that, um, you know, that kind of uh, approach, you know, that we are learning and we're developing and we want to, to get it right, the, the better. So thanks for that, Helen. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Thanks, Helen. And thank you, Charlotte, for that response. Salama too, would you like to uh, raise your point next? Yes. Thank you very much, Liz. Um, and thank you very much, um, Charlotte. It was very good to hear um, your work, about your work, what you have done so far. Um, there are a few things that I wanted, I want to bring up uh, from your presentation. Uh, you have talked about lack of diversity in the workforce. And um, you have also talked about um, teacher um, development uh, for the new curriculum. Um, I, I am aware of some of this because, um, Liz, you would remember that we did some uh, workshop around Windrush and we had to go to schools around Wales, uh, primary and secondary schools. And so, and also I did another workshop with the Pontio here in Banga and I had to go to five or six schools. And in all my outings, I did not meet one black teacher, not one. The second thing is the little information that we had to share with the children was also very interesting and informative to the teachers. So we talked about African, the, the, the region and how Africa is um, divided geographically we talked about the foods, we talked about dance, we talked about safari, wildlife, and things like that. Just simple things. And it was a huge new information to the children. We had them dance and all that, and it was very interesting. And I did a presentation afterwards. Uh, I'm sure Jessica was in one of the presentations where I talked about the need to take this forward, this was three years ago, I think, the need to take this forward and do a proper pilot, you know, and see how these things will work. When we did that, we didn't even know that a time will come that a committee will be set up for Black history um, um, curriculum development. We didn't know, but we did recommend. So it was actually surprising to us when we heard that 
a committee was set up and none of us here was invited. We have a, we have a membership, not Wales Africa Society, have a membership of 140 people right now. And nobody amongst us was invited from the grassroots to contribute because we have done you know, some work at the grassroots. It is not an offense at all, but it is, it is surprising if we should be consulted in some way to also you know, contribute our little, the little we know to such, such things. Um, I am actually particularly worried about how these teachers, the Welsh teachers are going to be developed in the shortest time period to be able to teach black history in schools. Um, would I, Liz would always say that black history is a shared history. So there's a perspective from here and there's the African Caribbean perspective. So which are you going to just focus on the perspective from here or you are going to source for information and um, um, what do you call it? And resource persons per se from Africa. I, I, I am, I'm unclear about that. There's so many questions in my mind. <laughs> there are so many questions. And this is, this is the first time that I am coming into contact with you, Charlotte. I've heard about you and your work, but there are so many things. I would love to read the report. I would love to read it and see what is there. And if you're open, I can give my, my feedback or my group can feed you back with what we feel and contribute. But it is really exciting to see that uh, we are in such times because we have also identified these gaps and feel that um, um, it is, it is um, what a welcome, um, uh, what do you call it? A welcome um, decision you know, that the Welsh government have decided to move forward with it. So thank you very much, um, Charlotte, and Lise also. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Salamatu Fada um, from up in Banga, uh, from in Banga uh, at present, aren't you, with your family and your brilliant organisation, the North Wales Africa Society. It's a little distressing to hear that you've not been involved before, Salamatu, but I'm sure this is something that can be rectified. So uh, thank you very much indeed, Charlotte. If I could just say, Salamatu, that's a great, um, a great little response you've given me there. And it's very nice to meet you and we're only down the road. So we will certainly talk and answer some of those wider questions. But I can just say that um, as part of the process, you know, we were set up last July to meet and we were to report before the minister, Kirsty Williams um, stood down. We had to get our report done before then, otherwise we wouldn't have got anywhere. And um, I, every single week I was myself in meetings, consulting with um, people on Zoom from Australia, um, which, you know, Liz will tell you the time difference that she's sitting there now. So we were trying very hard to speak with all, everybody. But what I really did want to acknowledge was this work was not, and I hope I said it in my first slide, this work does not emerge just from last July. All of you have been working so hard, some 13 or 14 years this lobby has been going on. Um, and, you know, I can attest to the fact that we benefited from that momentum and from that past and from the work that you have, had all done in the grassroots groups. So, Yes, I was invited to uh, lead this particular development, which was to get the report, you know, to consolidate what we already knew and get the messages out. And if you get the copy of the um, overhead, you can see the link to the report, so you'll be able to, to, to read that. But yes, thank you, Salva, too. And we, we will certainly meet and, and discuss how we can uh, support this development. <clears throat> now um, I'm just going to I'm aware of time going on we will have time at the end and I hope Charlotte you're okay to stay with us for a little while as Robert and um, 
uh, um, His Excellency George Ramakan will be. Um, but I'd just like one more question now, and then we'll we'll ask you um, to speak, um, uh, um, George Ramakan, please. After after this question, so Neil Lawrence. Thank you, Liz. Um, that you're, you're here with us, and it's also been great that your brother Levi joins us from Melbourne from time to time, and that you've been so supportive, telling us the story of your father, who was one of the people on actually on the Windrush Empire Windrush. Over to you, then, Neil. Thank you, Liz. Um, yes, um, I think um, much of what you've shared there, Charlotte. Um, I'm quite familiar with having worked in schools in Wales, um, doing cultural diversity work for about 10 years. And I've also worked as a supply teacher in primary and secondary schools um, in mid Wales. So I'm aware of the issues. I was just um, thinking um, um, sometimes, yeah, when, when um, you have developments like the Black Lives Matter, it obviously heightens people's awareness but I was thinking when it, when it comes down to it, um, who would really be able to deliver this kind of, the kind of training, the resources, the curriculum development that's necessary to really make um, a lasting impact? Um, so of course, you know, policies can be put in place. Um, you can make changes in the curriculum, but uh, who would really um, be in a position to um, to deliver this and to really make a lasting impact, which is really changing, you know, um, mindsets, you know, um, long established um, practices, you know, behaviors and so on. Yeah. So it's just really, how do you see this, you know, um, being carried out? Who would be delivering these um, initiatives? Yeah. Over to you, Charlotte. Thank you. I'll be brief because I know um, uh, we need to move on. I'd, I'd just like to say to, a couple of things. And, and thanks, Neil. It would be really good to talk to you more, more fully about this. Um, my response now is, A, towards John's question about, and this is the one about sustainability and the differences across the um, UK. We can locate this, and I, and I didn't have time to do it properly, but we can locate this development within the wider values-led orientation of Welsh social policy making. And, and, and that is very important for us to understand. It's a different basis on which these initiatives are emerging than, for example, in other parts of the UK, do I need to point specifically to <laughs> England. Um, and, and that makes me hopeful. That makes me hopeful because Wales cannot be moving towards the idea of an egalitarian society, citizen-led focus, well-being, you know, the future commissioner, um, uh, well-being and future commissioner report and, and, and all of these things without taking us along with it. So it's good that it's embedded in, in a wider value base. And I think that will be important. Now, as to your question, Neil, about who will be equipped and in a position to deliver this training, this development, da, 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 this is a big picture we're gonna need where all of us as stakeholders have to get involved, where the universities are going to have to, you know, really pick up their act in terms of initial teacher education where we're going to have to look nationally, but more internationally for as well for um, input. It's a, you know, it's a big ask and, and I'm not sure of the answer to your question. I can only hope that, you know, as a part of a co-production process, we can all together uh, support this development. But we do need, we need good trainers. We need trainers who understand the context of Wales and, and how to get through some of those issues I said about salience. I'm sure they're there. And part of my uh, being overseeing the implementation phase is to make sure that we do get the right kinds of people uh, involved. So yeah, thank you for that, Neil. And thank you for all your questions. Thank you, 
Well, thank you so much, Charlotte. As you can see, it's really, um, there's a lot of interest and, and a lot of people are going to be watching and a lot of people want to be involved as, as best they can. And some of the things we've experimented with over the last um, months um, may also be things that may we may be able to, to contribute to the, um, to the resource base. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Now, there are a couple of other questions from Jessica and from Gwyneth. And Charlotte, if you're staying with us, then we may go to those questions later on. So thanks very much indeed uh, to Professor Charlotte Williams. Great to see you and great to hear from you. And now His Excellency Seth George Ramakan. Um, I am so delighted to see you. Um, uh, <laughs> George, if I can... Yes. Oh, of course, yeah. of course, Liz. <laughs> I just have to go back to that wonderful time when uh, you came to Wales. Yes. Um, and we toured, uh, met people in South Wales and toured up to North Wales. And, and thank you and your wife, Dr. Lola Ramakan, so much for her support. And I know you know about the reparation projects we're involved in. But um, yes. I'm just going to hand over to you and and leave you to share with us whatever you feel is most appropriate at the moment. Okay. <laughs> so thanks so much for you in London. Well, well, thank you so much for that flexibility because um, I, I sort of, being among, uh, you know, scholars and academics and researchers, uh, I fall nowhere near there um, in that category. So I, I rather like listening to the, you know, to the, the work uh, Charlotte, for example, presented, and uh, I'm sure many of your other speakers will. Um, but, you know, I do have an interest in the matter. And so whatever I, I may say may not be sort of in line with a particular theme that you are uh, sort of focusing on in this uh, presentation. But may I first of all, just congratulate you, Liz, uh, Learning Links, for, you know, uh, taking on this project. And you mentioned, I think it's your 38th or I, I might have missed the exact number session. Yeah. But that's amazing. That's persistency. That's, that's really, you know, a, a great focus. And I'm sure that at the end of all of this, you will be, um, you know, raising the bar, lifting the, you know, the, the, the information uh, ladder a little higher and uh, that is what I think is you know the greatest obstacle it's a lack of uh, information on all sides all sides uh, about you know the um, the black uh, peoples of the world and uh, really just how uh, we are all to relate uh, to each other um, uh, the, you know, I always like to uh, think back at um, Marcus Garvey's statement, uh, which is, I think, very well known. I don't have to repeat it. He said, a, Peter, a, a people without the knowledge of their history and culture are like a tree without roots. And for me, that is, you know, a single statement that wraps it all up. Uh, this is not about Black people. It's about all peoples, all peoples who do not have a you know, meaningful understanding of their history, their culture. You know, a tree without roots means a tree that is dying. And that is really, uh, for me, a, a significant um, statement that belongs to all of us. And the situation is that we know that uh, the black peoples of the world, the, you know, their work, their history, their achievements, um, their failures, uh, you know, just honest um, history is not really um, part of world history, part of human history. Uh, you go to look for the books I mean, only in recent times, you know, there are some uh, writings on it. But when you talk about history, I, you know, going through school and you're going to do history, um, really what you do is European history, American history. Um, you don't do African history. 
Yet, this is the longest uh, um, surviving, uh, you know, culture, people um, that exists on the globe. Um, it, it, you know, there is quite a bit of work that uh, is being carried out by the Sudan Archaeological Research Society. And that is supported by the United Nations. There are over 50 countries involved in sponsoring um, that research. And quite a bit of um, information um, is unfolding about ancient African civilizations and their high level of sophistication, uh, you know, their advancement, uh, you know, compared with even those of the present. Um, these are things that are not sufficiently known, neither by the black peoples of the world, nor the white peoples or peoples of other color in the world. And that, that's darkness, uh, you know, um, ignorance that exists uh, is big, a big part of the problem. We, we have not really come to um, understand that the idea of a cyclical uh, system of cultures where cultures rise and they fall, some fall a little deeper, but that happens and we can point to, um, you know, Britain once ruled the world, it no longer does. It still is a strong country, but this is just recent history. Um, you know, America is, is the dominant power in the world, but everyone looks at America and say, America is now falling. Uh, and, and these are, are things that happen to human um, societies. And uh, we need to understand that uh, the black cultures, the black peoples of the world did have a place and it is, becoming so evident through the archaeological work that is being done, um, you know, there in, particularly in, in uh, Sudan. Um, an article I read from, it says the modern name for Nubia is Sudan. That's the old uh, nation of Nubia. And according to archaeological reports, the existence of rule by kings in Nubia indicates a more advanced form of political organization in which many uh, chiefdoms are united under a more powerful and wealthier ruler. That is, in a sense, the, the structure of government that partially exists in Britain today, uh, the existence of a king um, or, you know, a monarch, um, the, 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 the fact of uh, of rulership and, and law, um, all of this was part of um, African uh, society. You know, it, it goes on, it says, the discovery is expected to stimulate new appraisals of the origins of civilization in Africa, um, raising the question of what, of to what extent later Egyptian culture may have derived its advanced political structure from the Nubians. I don't think we know enough about this. And I believe that it is one of the things that uh, will cause um, the black peoples of the world to, to feel a sense of being lesser than. When it's really, um, it's my turn, it's my, you know, we were there been there, done that, fallen, and now going through the struggles. Um, I have a, you know, a, a sort of theological perspective on this, not just historical, um, you know, that comes from the book of Romans in the Bible, um, you know, which, which speaks about, uh, you know, people who knew God, turned their back upon God, and they became, uh, you know, depraved. Um, that that is the, 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 the history of this uh, country and not this country alone, but pretty much all societies, but then that's getting into religion. I know most people don't um, like to tread that path. So I, I will not go into that, but certainly there, there, there is literal physical evidence 
to prove the, um, the advancement of civilization of uh, the black peoples of the world. And I think therefore that the education system is really, uh, you know, the, the only real uh, path for, um, you know, sort of narrowing, um, you know, the, the, this uh, divide that now exists. Uh, and I, again, when I say education, I'm speaking about education of all peoples, because it is a lack of education on the black peoples of the world about themselves that create quite a bit of their, 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 their issues as to who they are. And it's a lack of education among the white peoples and other uh, uh, um, uh, cultures um, about the, the, the history that is creating this. We just don't understand. And therefore we come up with maybe various um, sort of uh, uh, theories, uh, you know, to show that there are, there are, are more superior people uh, to others and so on, which is a very backward um, way of looking at, at, at the, the, the subject. So I think that um, the, the work being done and it has been done, and I think you know you would have far more information that that I, I would have because this is an area um, that the, the the scholars who are present on on, on this uh, uh, forum would would have a better sense of where this research is at and how it is being used and what are the the um, the, the plans uh, for utilizing this and making it uh, better understood. And it's not only in terms of physical wealth, that is also another thing to be understood. Um, there is literature that um, suggests uh, that the, the whole idea of, um, you know, uh, education itself and philosophy, um, quite a bit of that, uh, predated Greek philosophy. And, um, you know, again, because there isn't much writing, there aren't much uh, research and literature, um, you know, that we can, we can pull on. Uh, this is where work needs to be done. Um, I have here in, in, in my notes, uh, um, a statement, which if I can uh, you know, if I can quickly look at it, in which uh, a statement that was actually um, made by by Plato uh, concerning the the um, the advancement of of uh, philosophy and um, and culture in Egypt that was way ahead of that of of, um, of uh, the Greeks, of Greek philosophy. But today we hear about Greek philosophy. We hear about the, 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 the you know, the, these very um, foundational and fundamental, uh, you know, thoughts and thinking that are shared with, with uh, us through literature. But um, there isn't much about philosophy prior to um, the, the Greek, you know, that is really popularly known around the world. There's nothing about philosophy. There's nothing about study, mathematics, and so on, as um, existed in, in Africa. So my concern is one in which I believe that our education system has failed us. I believe that... Um, I don't want to blame this on just singularly on any one culture. I think that uh, any people, they have a responsibility too for um, advancing knowledge about themselves. But history, you know, is filled with a lot of reasons why um, these, this has not been the case. So I just want to commend therefore the work that you are doing um, uh, through Learning Links and uh, work being done all 
in other areas that can be brought together to help us to get to the point where we are not speaking about the emotional things about, you know, just what people say about me or think about me. We want to get back to hard uh, facts. We want to get back to evidence-based uh, information. Uh, we, we want to, to do that because if the world is going to move away from its present um, uncivilized approach to the question of races and color and you know, prejudices and so on, it's going to be through a, a very um, um, re reliable, uh, you know, uh, education um, system, reliable information that, that is provable. And that is what I think um, I would like to be to see uh, be the outcome of the work that you're doing. So what I had to say was not a presentation of a study or anything, it's just some uh, views, some opinions and um, you know, I, I look forward to hearing the the uh, rest of the presentations that will take place. Well, thank you so much, and thank you. Those uh, those reflections are really powerful, and I'm sure have made us us all all think. And it's also wonderful that you are supported by two of your colleagues, Vivian Crawford from the oh, Institute. Yes. <laughs> We're delighted to see you, and of Bernard Janke, also from the Institute of Jamaica, who has a number of responsibilities, as does Vivian, but um, he's, uh, he leads the Jamaica Memory Bank. Of so course. that's really <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. And I think one of the things that these Black History lunchtime conversations have brought together um, is expertise from around the world. Professor Sati Fwakshat hasn't been able to join us today. He's from Joss University in Nigeria. Um, but he's been a real strength to us and helping us to see from an African perspective, not from a European perspective. So um, I can see, Neil, is your hand still up from before or, um, or not? Oh, I'm not uh, sorry, um, <laughs> I'll put it down. Okay. And Chris, did you want to say something from the South Wales Jamaica Society? I need to let you. <laughs> thank you. Um, firstly, um, thank you, um, Excellency, um, for your thoughts, um, which actually I concur with. Um, you make great points about ancient Kemet history and the Sudan. Most of the Kemet people migrated to the Sudan and it's been proven and you come with great talk about um, science and um, actually philosophy. You know, I just pulled this up. Apocrites born 40, 460 BC is known as the father of medicine. Imata born 270 BC is, is known as the god of medicine. You know, Greek philosophers, all of the Greek philosophers studied in Africa. You, um, they themselves as philosophers were outcast from Greece, so they, from Greece so that they could not preach that foreign doctrine in Greece itself. So a lot of history has been hidden and on purpose as well, you know, even to writing and education, you know, all other countries write from sunrise to sunset, England writes to other, Europe writes to other way. That was the Greeks again, changing the system of their learning because before then, everyone else, everybody wrote that way. So we understand education is a shared world education that you're saying it belongs to everyone. And um, I think the truth of the matter is we've made great strides in Wales. We look at um, ways and means to, to educate the young and the elderly. The resources, what we've got though, is it, it is the human resource, you know, because Wales is a multicultural 
um, country. We have um, elders and people of knowledge from all nationalities. You know, it's going to be a concerted effort. It, it, when, when we talk of Black history in Wales, we, 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 we only talk of it as Black history, because as you refer to, Black history is everyone's history. Um, it's a shared world history. So um, I'm only happy to, for your statement that um, Professor Charlotte Williams, and she will say to you that we've got Abu Barker who talks of Kemet and we have our own um, people who are learning and will, will speak of ancient times, but they will only speak of it. it it's got to be coming in, 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 in the curriculum. It has to be set in there because it's the beginning. We talk of ancient Egypt. I'm gonna wrap it up please. Um, we talk of ancient Egypt, but we already know that the Egyptians, um, their temples were based on spirituality and what they was looking at was the Twa people. And that's how they got the columns and they, they looked at spirituality. So actually there's a, there's a lot to be learned by everyone. And um, the further back we go is the more forward we can become. Excellency, thank you very much, sir. Um, please, thank you. Thank you, Chris Campbell. Your contributions are always very welcome. And thank you so much for the uh, big contribution you've made over the last 38 weeks. It's been really significant. And I thank you personally, Chris. Thanks. Right, now we're going to ask Professor Robert Burroughs, um, who uh, hasn't joined us before on one of these sessions, but he's been researching on one of the projects that we've been, um, we've focused on, on on a couple of occasions, and that is the project about the African Institute. Now, Jean Williams is here. Jean, it's lovely that you're able to join us. Um, and I know that you've been in touch with uh, Professor Burroughs. Um, Jean is the great, great granddaughter, I think I've got this right, of the Reverend William Hughes, an amazing character whose life works um, enable him to set up an African institute in Colwyn Bay. It's a fabulous story. It's a really interesting story. Um, and we were delighted to know <laughs> that Professor Burroughs was working away at Leeds Beckett University and researching the stories of the students because that's what we felt was missing. We knew quite a bit about uh, Jean's great grandfather um, and we knew quite a bit about from the records the African Institute, but we didn't know so much about the students. So we've been talking with Salama Fada from the North Wales Africa Society and saying, you know, it would be great to do some more research. And then we discovered, Professor Burroughs, that you'd been getting on with it. So we're really pleased and we're looking forward to getting a copy of your book when it's published, <laughs> I think, later in the year. Over to you then. That's lovely, thank you. Um, I'm just about to share my screen, so bear with me. I'm gonna to have to bear with my concentration face for a moment while I work out how to do this. Um, can you now see my PowerPoints? Yes, yes. Me too, good. Okay, I do, I have, as you can see, I've only got a few slides to share. I have got a research paper, which I'm gonna to turn to in a moment, but let me begin by just sort of saying, Gosh, I found today so inspiring and I feel rather in, almost intimidated in truth by the brilliance of the um, presentations and speeches so far. Um, I attempted almost to abandon my paper in truth and reflect on Charlotte's comments, which I found fascinating about the sort of bitty and piecemeal nature of putting a spotlight on particular aspects of black history in Wales, which I fear now my paper is in some danger of doing. I wish, had I, had a, I wish I'd prepared a slightly different paper from a different bit of the book, which looks at um, Colwyn Bay really and the significance to Colwyn Bay of having a school of Africans in its stead and, um, and thinks about you know, the, the investments made by donors to the school and what they got out of giving their money and their time to thinking about this school. Um, I, I, I've been reflecting on His Excellency's words 
about how this is a history for all of us. And, and I hope that some of that will come across in, in what I'm talking about today. But um, I do intend to do my research paper. And what I'm going to do is spend five minutes or so just recounting this history of the African Institute for you before then moving on to talk about my particular area of focus, which as Liz has just said, is the students of the school. And this is part of a slightly wider project by me where I'm looking at um, st students of African descent in 19th century Britain, um, in which the school in Colwyn Bay figures very centrally. So um, between 1889 and 1911, the small town of Colwyn Bay, which many of you will know very well as a holiday resort in North Wales, played host to this unusual experiment in imperialism, charity, and race relations. Um, the Congo Training Institute, as it was first called, was the invention of Reverend William Hughes, a Baptist missionary who had served in Central Africa right at the start of its colonization by Europeans. Hughes's own time in the Congo was defined by the death of his colleagues, his own sickness, and his struggles to preserve a fledgling group of young boys who he felt were open to Christian instruction. And in the end, it was his own ill health that forced Hughes to abandon his mission in the Congo, and with it, so it transpired, his whole missionary career. But he took two boys, Kinkasa and Kanza, with him from Africa, and once returned to Wales with these boys, he struck upon this idea um, to import young Africans for practical education and religious training in what he regarded to be the sort of morally and uh, medically healthier climes of his native homelands. His intention was to prepare students both as preachers and as sort of artisans, and he expected them to return to Africa as self-supporting missionaries um, the idea being that they would no longer require resources from the traditional mission bodies based in Britain. By 1890, Hughes had founded a school in a large Victorian building, which he renamed Congo House, and he formed a Congo Training Institute committee to overlook his work and to help attract support from subscribers. And the entire scheme was completely dependent on the generosity of um, subscribers to his scheme. He also secured patronage in 1891 from two of the uh, leading and now most notorious names in the colonization of the Congo, Henry Morton Stanley and King Leopold II of Belgium. Um, between 1888 and 1891, Kinkasa and Nkanza were followed to North Wales by nine more students from the Congo and the Cameroons. Their schoolwork became routine and many of the male students were entered into apprenticeships with local tradespersons. Often the students performed in lectures and in sermons, as well as in other forms of entertainment, helping to drum publicity for the school. And some of the youths from this period emerged as sort of star pupils really, who were keenly supported by the local community during their uh, preparations for their return to Africa. Now the supply of students from Central Africa was ended in around 1894 as the Congo state authorities banned educational migration. That's a move which historians have looked at previously, um, but which I won't go into further detail here. Um, Hughes had seen this coming and in 1893, he established recruitment depots in various other territories, in the German occupied Cameroons, in the Republic of Liberia, and in the British Niger Coast Protectorate. And then in other parts of West Africa, including Sierra Leone, Lagos, and the Gold Coast, today's Ghana, um, African supporters of Hughes's venture emerged and they formed associations that provided financial assistance and publicity, helping to select new trainees. And that aspect of this story, African um, charitable donations to a cause in North Wales is something that Hughes marveled at in his own time, and which I think is an important part of this story, is which reverses some of our assumptions and ideas about the flow of charity in the late 19th century. 
Um, in, the, in the early 1900s, the catchment of Congo House expands further, and it includes small numbers of students arriving from as diverse territories as Southern Africa, the USA, and the Caribbean. Now, in total, it looks like there's around 87 students, including three girls and young women who attended Congo House. That's according to lists published by Hughes himself. But the overall number of students is quite debatable because Hughes seems to have overlooked some individuals and to have nominated some others whose relation to the school is actually quite ambiguous. And now this confusion is significant. The school collapses in 1911 amid a racist sting operation in the British press concerning the fathering of a child with a local woman by one man who'd been registered as a student. And in a subsequent libel trial, it emerged that Hughes had been under all kinds of financial pressures over several years and had ended up falsifying an account. He'd misled some donors on the details of student registrations, and he'd even borrowed the bequest of one of the students. So the trial ends up ruining Hughes, um, who died in very diminished circumstances in 1924. Now, in my talk, I don't want to recount the controversies of those latter years. I want instead to focus on the students and their experiences before, during and after their time in Colwyn Bay. Um, Liz has mentioned just a second ago that that might be an area where there's been less work done. There's actually been some really good scholarship in the mid 1980s by somebody called Hazel King in this area. But on the whole, I think there's a risk that in some of the earlier accounts of the school, um, the students have been treated in quite broad, undifferentiated terms. And if you go back to writing from the time, whether it's the European missionaries or their supporters, the Pan-African intellectuals who take interest in the scheme, frequently they attempt to understand the students in terms of their sort of racial or sort of broad African, I'm, I'm doing the quotation marks thing if you're not looking at me at the moment, the African identities of the students. Um, of course, they're brought together by their shared racial heritage, but otherwise the student body is really quite diverse in terms of social and cultural background, age and place of origin. So I, I think it's important to disaggregate their experiences. The students of Congo House, in fact, reveal the diversity of black experience at the heart of the British Empire. And in telling their story, retelling their story, I think we ought to heed Stuart Hall's points about cultural identity being not always just about roots, as in our double OTS, but often sometimes and very often about um, coming to terms with our roots, R-O-U-T-E-S. It's a quote which works better on paper than it does in a presentation, but you see the point that I'm making here. Um, we need to not just think about um, where these students were coming from, but also where that took them to. And that's one of these areas in which this history, I think, opens up and, and speaks truths to all of us, all of us who've been through educational journeys in our lives. So a focus on their journeys to, their experiences in, and lives beyond the school reveals quite radically different experiences for the students, owing to the specifics of context. Now, because of the limitations on time, which I'm conscious of, I want to just highlight one, I think, really vitally important factor in differentiating between these students, one which I think has been a bit neglected in some of the earlier studies. And that's that shift away from Congo-based recruitment of the students from, by European missionaries, the period of the Congo Training Institute, roughly speaking. And then that movement toward an African sponsored or initiated recruitment of students from parts of Western Africa and, um, uh, and in Liberia too. This is the period of the African Training Institute. In its early guises, the Congo Institute offered up to donors an image, a, ra a rather um, stereotypical and crude image of, uh, again, I'm doing quotation marks, of darkest Africa to be rescued through civilizing, the civilizing goodwill of Europeans. And while that imagery remained in place after 1893, the renamed African Institute also came to accommodate other ideas, ideas about Ethiopianism, 
the championing of Afrocentric Christianity. Um, ideas which were shared among independent church leaders in Western and Southern Africa. And really interestingly, actually, one of the things that does happen in this school is that um, the ancient African origins of Christianity get discussed in Colwyn Bay in some of the sermons which are given in the mid 1890s. Um, as this kind of educational diet changes, the age and the backgrounds of the students who have been selected for travel to North Wales also changes. And with these factors, the overall purpose of the school just subtly shifts in the 20th century. And we can see this um, demonstrated, sorry, I've forgotten my own slides. That's a bit of a schoolboy error, but here's some pictures. Um, oh, I've, sorry, I'm, I'm a novice. I've spent all year, as you can imagine, as an academic doing um, presentations um, and so on, on, on but I'm, I'm usually on Teams, not on Zoom. So I'm just getting acquainted to Zoom. Here's a few pictures, which I should have shown you five minutes ago, um, representative of um, some aspects of the Congo or African Training Institute of Colwyn Bay, but I've made my way to the part of the paper now where I'm actually gonna zero right in and focus it on just two individual students um, from different eras of the school, which I think illustrate very different routes through education in Britain. So the first student I'm gonna to speak to you about is Frank Taylor Clark. He was the fourth student to join the school and he had been sent there by American Baptist missionaries in the Congo. Um, like all the early recruits, Teva had been recruited, redeemed, sorry, from slavery before working at mission stations in the Lower Congo in around about 1880. Um, he remained in, in missions in the Congo for about five years. He was baptized in 1885 by Joseph Clark, who gave Teva his own surname and then sent him on to Europe along with a young female ward of his named Lena Vunga Clark. In securing the passage of these youths redeemed from slavery, such as Tava, Hughes continued the work he'd begun with Kinkasa and in Kansa, and his donors were able to understand what he was doing here. And really, um, the, the inclusion of these students presented a very clear extension in his own project of evangelically redeeming students from slavery. Taver would go on to prove himself to be a very popular, talented recruit, and he comes to the fore of much of the school's publicity materials. Unfortunately for the historian, his letters to Hughes um, are published by Hughes for several years after Taver himself had left the school, which he did in about 1893. Um, Taver's letters to Hughes after leaving the Cong Congo Institute are optimistic accounts of his own looming missionary career. He desired to go and work with his own people, but he was actually propelled on, um, not to the Lower Congo where he was born, but to the Upper Congo territories. He came to reside close to Joseph Clark again at the Ikoko station um, in the Equator region of the Congo. Taver clearly felt that he'd been compelled on by a higher authority, expressing his belief as part of a kind of total embrace of a new way of life. Hughes marveled at Taver's transformation, remarking, and I quote, I know of no better preacher for them. He is like them, yet superior to them. In a letter to Catherine, Hughes's wife, Taver stated he'd been appointed by God, who had spoken to him, saying, and I quote again, this is a letter from Tava to Catherine's wife. He said that God had spoken to him saying, Frank, leave your father and mother and friends and come to work for me for I am your king. What a gratification it is to have God as your king and father, Tava says. I'm indeed very happy that my name is written in the book of life, but sorry about my friends at home, but it is their own fault. They got the chance and yet they prefer to work for the devil. So it's very much in the language of the book of Revelation then that Tava predicts his own people's exclusion from the book of life, narrates his own rescue from this fate in carrying out God's design. But while Tava was reprimanding his family for their service supposedly of the devil, in the Congo, the people themselves were rethinking their own understandings of the meanings of such terms describing the actions of their white conquerors. 
time at the Akoka station soon revealed to Teva instances of brutality. And, and Akoko was right at the heart, it was a key site in the so-called rubber wars of the mid-1890s, in which colonial officers and their soldiers waged murderous violence on local communities in the pursuit of rubber and ivory, ivory meeting some resistance. Uh, one early critic was Taver's own master, Joseph Clark. His letters and statements brought the situation in Ikoko to leaders of the American Baptist Missionary Union. And as other missionaries and eyewitnesses published evidence in the mid 1890s, indignation grew among humanitarian societies. The mission's support for the Congo Free State became increasingly untenable and the British government was eventually forced into action. The British government was quite slow to act. It had been receiving worrying reports from officials for more than a decade. But in 1903, the Foreign Office commissioned its consul in the Congo an Irishman named Roger Casement to undertake a tour of inspection in the Upper River regions. Casement's lengthy, clear-sighted report, which was published in early 1904, unequivocally blamed the colonial authorities for several abuses, including notoriously, and I'm sure many of you will know this already, um, the dismemberment of hands of living and dead rubber workers by sentries seeking to account for their acts of reprisal. A Liverpool journalist named Edie Morrell formed a Congo Reform Association in which Casement was a crucial contributor. And soon an international Congo reform movement had been ignited. Now, when Casement visited Lake Mantumba, where Akoko is, um, he stayed for more than two weeks with the Clark's family. And during that time, Taver testified to him, giving evidence of terrible state-sponsored acts of violence. Of the notorious practice of cutting hands, he declared, and I quote, that no one here at Ikoko doubted for a moment that this was done by the command of the European officers themselves. And besides noting his own role in protecting the people and detailing specific incidents, Taver speaks out on behalf of the people, taking on the role of protester and representative in humanitarian concerns. So he told Casement that the villagers felt, and I quote now, the white men have come to this country to steal everything they want from the people. And if they object, they will be killed. They're afraid to complain to the government white men because when the soldiers rob them, because they would not be believed. And also because they do not trust or believe in the government white men themselves. Casement regarded Taver as, an, he, he called him an honest, fearless and truthful witness. And he was aware of his overseas education. But even so, Casement's, sorry, Taver's testimony is barely mentioned in Casement's official report. Um, curiously, Taver kind of gets airbrushed out and I'd be willing afterwards or in personal correspondence with you to say more about why I think that happens. But as a result of it, Tabor himself becomes one of several today unrecognized Africans who helped to put an end to Leopold's reign of terror in the Congo by communicating to sympathetic listeners the evidence that led to international condemnation and very gradually and very slightly an improvement in the people's lived circumstances. Um, it seems a shame that this is less well known, uh, that this information about Tabor is not well known, but for Teva himself, the concealment of this part of his story in secular affairs might just have been fully in agreement of his overriding sense of spiritual purpose. Teva remained an important figure in the Baptist missions in the Okoko region until his death in 1927. That's one of my lives that I'm going to look at, and if I've got five more minutes, if that's okay, Liz, I'm going to keep going and look at one more student um, who really, I think, is representative to some extent of what happens in the second half of the history of Congo House. Of course, if I were looking at a different student, a different set of findings would be entirely what comes out of this. But I'm going to put the spotlight on Kwesi Awusi for now. Now, Kwesi Awusi was a Fanti student who'd ventured to Congo, sorry, Kowimbe in 1899. He was one of the so-called Gold Coasters, whose arrival 
in Britain seems to be directly connected to the mining industry. Um, there are various upturns in educational travel from Gold Coast over to Britain, which coincide with booms in the floating of gold mining firms between 1898 and 1902. Um, and at that time, the young Gold Coast students um, sort of serving as spokespeople for African entrepreneurs, negotiating with Liverpool companies. Now, immediately you can see this is a very different sort of set of, set of circumstances leading this individual to come and reside and study in Colwyn Bay to that which um, brought Tava there. Some of the Gold Coast students, including Awusi, also spent time in the Camborne School of Mines, which is in Penryn, and they would go on to careers in mechanized mining. And Iwusi, interestingly, used the platform provided by the African Institute to give public speeches on this topic. So at a garden party in Colwyn Bay in the summer of 1900, for instance, he was, and I quote, interesting in his neat speech on gold mines of the Gold Coast, according to the local press. Given that he'd been schooled in the very respected Wesleyan High School in the Gold Coast, given that he was aged 18 at the time of his arrival, and given that he was bound on a certain career path, it's probably unsurprising that Iwusi's time in Colwyn Bay was brief. All the Gold Coast arrivals between 1889 and 90, sorry, 1898 and 99 didn't stay for very long. They all departed within two years of their arrival. Awusi left particularly quickly, however, and a family history records that he was underwhelmed by the standard of tuition which had been on offer to him in North Wales. It's a little reminder actually of something that Charlotte was speaking about uh, earlier, I think, to some extent about uh, competence. And the fact is that many of the students who arrived in the latter stages had had a better, more thorough formative education than the tutors who were able to teach them once they'd arrived in Colwyn Bay. So they moved on. And as Ray Jenkins notes in his brilliant study of these students, well-traveled students from the Gold Coast, Gold Coast knew where and how to seek out sympathetic assistance. They looked to the humanitarian bodies, they looked to their professions, they looked to the trading firms in Liverpool, they got help from Freemasons, from the friendly societies, from temperance societies. And it's these kind of links which probably helped Awusi. He moved on and he gained extra tuition for, from a person called Miss S. E. Marples. An interesting figure, she was a daughter um, of a publishing family who supported Pan-African writers in Britain, published their works in the early 1900s. And they probably helped move Awusi on to study at the Oaks Institute in Birkenhead. He moved on again and matriculated at the University of Liverpool in 1904, having won a scholarship to study there. Interestingly, over at Liverpool, they've got no record of his graduation and that tallies with the family history, which says that um, financial support for Awusi could not be sustained through the whole course of his degree. And later mention of him in the press says that he qualified without honors, which probably sounds about right. From 1904, he was busy nonetheless, though. What he did was um, found a really important, help found a really important um, Ethiopianist association in Britain. I put up um, an image from one of its documents on this slide here, and I should explain and apologize. I don't have a picture of Kwesi Awusi to um, illustrate this slide. If anybody knows one, please do share, because I'd love to have one. But, um, but on the right-hand side of this slide, you can see a document by the Ethiopian Progressive Association of Liverpool, a Pan-African network which emerged right at the start of the century in which Iwisi was a major player in. The EPA, as I'm going to call it, published at least one edition of a quarterly magazine called the Ethiopian Review, and later reports credit Iwisi as being its editor. The EPA captured the attention of the West African press in 1905, um, and it would certainly influence student activist politics among Africans in Britain in the first decades of the 20th century. But it was a quite short-lived endeavor with many of its members moving quickly on to new careers. And after his own brief foray into student politics, Awusi himself moved on 
to his intended career in mining. He had some successes in founding his own company, but then experienced the devastating impact of recessions brought on by the First World War prior to his death in Nigeria in 1924, aged just 43 years. So there we go. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to conclude now and just to sort of say two lives there, very briefly rushed over, but which I think are illustrative of the very different experiences offered by education at Congo House. And while one of those lives, Frank Taver Clark's, demonstrates a quite close commitment to the kinds of outcomes which Hughes had anticipated and expected of his students. That other student, Kwesi Awusi, his is a much more sort of fleeting collision leading to a very different path. So together, these lives show that the idea of the civilizing mission as promoted by this school could give rise to very different trajectories for black people's experiences, very different routes through Britain in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. But I'll leave it there. Thanks so much for listening. Well, thank you so much, Robert. And again, it's just brilliant that you've been able to, to summarize. You've been able to summarize. So absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and I know within our, our group here, we've got, uh, got folks with a real um, close link here. Now, Charlotte, I know that you've you've studied and written about this story in the past. Um, uh, I know I've got one of your publications here, like everybody does, bring their copy of A Tolerant Wales <laughs> to the fore. Okay. Um, Charlotte, unmute yourself, Charlotte. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you so, so much, Robert. What a fantastic presentation. I'm so I'm beside myself with excitement about this. <laughs> um, because there's been so much focus on, you know, mm, 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 the Institute and, in the past and, and, and the way it's been portrayed in one kind of Ivor Wynne Jones, Draper, Chris Draper kind of trajectory. And we haven't heard the voices like, you've given us voices and and kind of careers and um placing it in the context of the pan-africanism and um broader education and how resourceful they were but you know why i'm so fascinated is because i'm writing a novel about the girl lula coops oh lulu <laughs> yes and um you know, I really, I, her life just sort of comes to an end. And of course, I'm taking it, you know, in, in a fictional direction. And um, I'm halfway through this novel, so I'm so excited. And of course, you mentioned three girls, Ernestina, Mabel and, and Lulu, Lulu. And of course, um, we don't hear their voices really either, you know, so much. We know something about, you know, how they were supported and something about it. So... All I'm saying now is, can I talk to you some more? <laughs> <laughs> it would be really lovely for me to um, have some more factual information to support my fictionalised account. Well, of course, I'd absolutely love that, Charlotte. And thank you for those comments. And um, I had to just kind of, to get through this paper, I had to temporarily forget that there's so many people listening to it who are actually brilliantly well placed and well informed about the history and you're right at the fore of that and I, I should say I really enjoyed um, Sugar and Slate which has a, a brilliant perspective on this history as well of course a very personal one to you. Um, Lulu Coote, um, yeah her, her life sort of disappears from the record as far as people have been able to work out so far there's some good information recently I'm sure you're aware of this recently posted up by Jeff Green on his fabulous website and even some photos which I think is so valuable to this history, aren't they? The photographs sort of bring to life in a way, um, although they, they need to, of course, be read in context themselves, bring to life this story in brilliant ways. But I'm, I'm well, over the moon to hear that you're working on, on, a, on a novel on this. <laughs> um, it's so time, timely yeah. focused to say, um, you know, Lulu, after moving on from Congo House, spends her career working um, in, in, in in hospitals mm. um, and is 
a link to this another sort of really under acknowledged history about you know the contribution of black people to healthcare and health provision in Britain, which was just on the telly last night, of course. Um, the Young Historian Project, which um, is happening down in the south of England, which involves uh, young historians and is really trying to target um, getting young students onto degree programs and into postgraduate degree programs in history where there's severe underrepresentation. I've been working on that side of things too. So that's another area to look at if you're not already looking at, at that. Um, but yeah, that's fabulous. My book um, does mention Lulu, of course, but only sparingly. I've, I have spent a bit more time in, in the draft of the book on one of the other young women, Ernestina Francis. Ernestina, yeah. 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 Four managers. Right, yeah, who who's, who's remains at the school. I think I'm right in saying longer than anyone else. Well, she actually came back. Yes, that's right. Yeah, mm, it's lovely to be hearing from you. So well, she's buried in her my great grandfather's daughter's um, grave. She's buried near to with the family and next to the family in Common Bay. Yeah, and I have to say it's been wonderful in past years to be able to work with Eugene and Nan and other members of the family and, and other local people. A really, a, a, in a very interesting local research project with support from Col Colwyn Bay Town Council from, from our point of view and Marion Gwynne was much involved as well um, and ongoing. Um, so Charlotte, when you're thinking and this goes back to this, you know, bits and pieces. We need to pull together a, a way that people can explore local links with black history. And then maybe schools can share with other schools. Who knows what, what that can be? Um, so fabulous. Anything else, Jean, from you, first of all? Um, not really, but Charlotte, Dr. Charlotte, um, was a very close friend of a journalist called Ivor Wynne Jones who was very, very um, supportive of the Institute in its, you know, after its time. But I found yeah. out so much more. Yeah, she remembers it. Um, I recently found the banana boat manager that actually transported the children over. He actually yeah. lived in the village where I live. And wow. Not only um, donated to the Institute by bringing the boys over, but also donated to the village in the way of community centres. And so it's just all coming out now, and um, which is wonderful. That's After so many years of knocking my head on the door, you know, yeah. it's just suddenly exploded, really. Jean, I don't know if I told you that I was doing a bit of research and I found a lot of pa uh, papers that had been sent to me by the archives and I discovered my own oh, father, father. Mm -hmm. it's called John Williams. He'd been researching this same story, so mm -hmm. it's lovely. And now um, we've also got the autograph book that we need to get Robert in touch with uh, Gwyneth as well. So. Um, that will be something, a, a next step for us. All right, now I'm also going to ask um, Salama too, is there anything that you wanted to add? Not specially. Or um, Gwyneth Kensler, Gwyneth's uh, a good campaigner up, uh, up in that area. Mm -hmm. and. Well, I was yes, I, I, had, I had a few questions for Charlotte. Okay, well, before we do those, let's just wrap up these questions here then, and then we'll come back to that, if that's all right, Gwyneth. I'm, yes, I'm of course. And, um, Helen, now, Helen, that's interesting. Uh, please. You had the uh, comment about... Please, can that. I come in? Yes. Please? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that, that, yes, sorry. Yeah, can I come in? I know that... Uh, well done. Thank you very much, Robert, for uh, a very robust presentation. Um, I, have, um, I have discussed this issue so many times with Liz and I have um, watched Marianne's um, video on YouTube. Uh, so we are quite aware of um, the history from the African Institute of Cowin Bay. 
um, going forward, we are just thinking of what we can do from the history to now. So there are many of us here that are settlers, some um, short term immigrants. So they come for um, education and as hospital workers and things like that. But because we have made North Wales our home, we feel that that history can be used to explore things, areas that we can actually um, develop and move forward with it in this contemporary times. So we are still talking with Lise and um, definitely very soon we can come up with things and we will probably need you, Robert. <laughs> so we, we, we may be inviting you to one of our meetings so that you can just give this uh, background information and then we can then see how we can move forward from here. But thank you, I really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you for the invitation just briefly. Much. And um, I'd, just to say, I think that is one of the ways forward for this research, isn't it? Is to sort of try to find uses for it and, it, and the, the uses that exist in the stories of the students for people to reflect on today. But I'll leave it there. Lovely. Helen, you must have been fascinated to see the Ethiopian Progressive Association. You've spent time in Ethiopia. Although I, I think the term Ethiopian at that time just simply meant it was like the, the Black African, wasn't it? Because uh, Ethiopia at that time was more locally known as Abyssinia. So it, was, it wasn't the Ethiopians as such. But I did have a, a, just a couple of points. I mean, I'm fascinated because uh, Jean Williams, I don't know if you remember me, but you introduced me to the book Scandal when we were on uh, walks uh, with the, in the Cluidian area. And so uh, I... Oh, <laughs> Helen, I know, sorry, Stanley, yeah. Yeah, but I, I researched Stanley when I was researching mainly his wife, Dorothy Tennant and that. And, uh, you know, I, I'm always worried when Stanley gets lumped with uh, Leopold, for whom he did work for a number of years. But really from 18, um, certainly from 1890, but probably a lot earlier than that, Stanley had basically washed his hands on Leopold. He saw where he was going and didn't really want to be uh, associated with him, apart from when he needed ships in order to be able to rescue him in Pasha. Uh, 1890 he returned and he never returned to Central Africa so all the kind of connections with you know I mean he was never into slavery anyway he was very much like Livingstone uh, trying to stop slavery in Africa so I just kind of always kind of get nervous when I hear people kind of lump them both in the same boat Tim Geale's book as I'm sure Gwyneth would attest is the book to read if you really want to find out about you know what, um, what Stanley was like yeah, he had his bad points, but on the whole, I think he was far, far different from Leopold. But I've been fascinated by this. It is, you know, I mean, living near Colwyn Bay, and like I say, reading the book, The Scandal at Congo House, it, it is a fascinating story. And I really look forward to reading Charlotte's book, because I too love to see, uh, you know, uh, novels made of, of historical subjects that, you know, basically, you know, entertain us as well as informing us. And I think there should be a lot more of that, don't you, Liz? <laughs> Well, you see, Helen knows that I became a convert to historical novels <laughs> to your wonderful book and uh, very much look forward to yours, Charlotte, and, uh, and the, the other books that are being written currently. But I'm now going to ask you, Gwen, so thank you, Helen, for that. Um, Robert, I don't know if you wanted to come back on any of those points. Uh, no, that's absolutely fine. Just to say, I think, um, you know, as well as, as, as Helen's just said there, the, the, the thought of a novel so important actually as a, as a means to history as well you know it's not just about entertaining is it as, as Helen said um, this is one of the ways that we can kind of fill in histories which are sometimes so hard otherwise to access so yeah that kind of creative approach to history I think is really welcome but I will I will shut up now <laughs> we'd love you to carry on but we're going to have to wrap up at some stage but before we do um, I'd just like to um, thank you again Robert. Um, Gwyneth I'm not sure if you've got any points for Robert but I know we want you wanted to follow up a couple of points with um, with Charlotte. So Gwyneth Kensler over to well, you. Yes the only thing I would say about um, the book and the Colwyn Bay Institute is uh, to refer to Charlotte and the curriculum and Kenebin 
and that is a very good example, I think, Kanevin meaning our locality and learning from specifics in our locality and uh, also getting facts, getting the data, and get, not using the emotion. So excellent. Okay, were there any other points, Gwyneth? Any other points, Gwyneth? Do you want to ask Charlotte anything else? Um, well, if I may, uh, it is fascinating. And uh, having gone through curriculum change myself when I was a teacher, I know just the upheaval it means. Uh, uh, certainly, the local authorities uh, in, in Wales are going to have to be very active in providing training uh, alongside the universities. But uh, I think unlike England, we don't have academies and all schools have to pursue uh, the curriculum. So uh, hopefully it will, there will be the resources there because it's, got, it's an expensive um, uh, step to take. Uh, and it is, it does have to be resourced properly. And uh, I, I was fascinated to learn about or to hear about the Egyptians. And I think this is, there is so much to, to history. I did a history degree in Bangor. And there is so much to history from knowing about the contribution of the Egyptians, uh, and the Chinese, and we in Denby, we have a lot of Filipinos and Turks and Indians. So you can't just say one black history is covering everybody, uh, of course, as Charlotte uh, has said. And how do we how do we narrow it to a certain uh, ethnic group uh, at times? And then, of course, in Glancluid, the hospital we have uh, nearby, we have a lot of consultants and doctors, nurses from various countries in the world. Uh, in fact, I, I know, used to have to give Spanish lessons to a, an Egyptian consultant. Uh, so the resources, the human resources are there. We can ask these people, including people like Colin Jackson, the sprinter, Vaughan Gethin, uh, to come into schools and to give their own personal histories. So, Diolch Mariani Baub. Diolch. Diolch Gwyneth. Diolch Thank you very much indeed. So, um, just brilliant. So we'll just formally wrap things up now as it's our, our 38th session, but we did promise ourselves that we'd do some longer sessions this last few weeks. And we've certainly been able to, to, to do a lot and to, help us also to think about how to take these things forward. So all comments in uh, at any stage will be very welcome. There was one comment in, chat, in the chat from um, Jessica uh, um, Clapham, who um, wanted to say uh, how much she enjoyed your presentation, um, Charlotte, and she, uh, she I I'm scrolling back down it now and I can't see where it is. Um, saying how important it is that we have have uh, good colleagues who can really share the message and share the message well. And she mentioned Yasser Safari, and we have to thank him very much indeed because he's been a great support to us during this program. It's an impossibly early hour, so, so I'm really impressed that Bernard um, uh, is here and, and Vivian because it is early in Jamaica. Um, so yes, we've had great help from all, all over the place. Now, before we just say our final thank yous, we have got Vivian Crawford, the Director of the Institute of Jamaica, as a guest with us today, and also Bernard Janke. Vivian, I don't know if you'd like to say a few words. Come on. Sort out your microphone. Sorry. That's I'm, it, accustomed, I'm accustomed to the ebbing. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Liz, Your Excellency, 
um, Seth George Ramakan guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, Bernard Janke from the African Caribbean Institute of Jamaica and myself, we, we thank you for your kind invitation and um, you will allow me to commend, please, you, Dr. Liz, for your never failing to mobilize and to inspire. Thank you very much. And oh, High Commissioner Seth George must be saying our paths crossed again. But it is for me to say to the High Commissioner what we were taught in teacher training college. Treat every child as a king or a queen. You do not know which one is going to wear the crown. And High Commissioner is now in the presence of the crown. 200 years ago, a meeting of this nature might not have been possible. And as Jamaicans, we must echo the words of our national hero, right excellent Marcos Masaya Garvey, who said that a people without the knowledge of their history, heritage, culture is like a tree without root. Mm -hmm. So what Dr. Liz is challenging us today is reminding us to steer away from acculturation. We can learn from one another. We should respect diversity. We all travel to our Colwyn Bay. We all travel to our Colwyn Bay. And we, have from, we had from Wales, uh, Miss Lucy Holmes, who traveled to Jamaica years ago to work at the Wortley Home, a home for children, girls, whose parents were not able to take care of them. And that home was founded by a Maurice Wortley and his father. And Maurice died at the Battle of the Somme. Nothing but good can come from this. And we, we want to invite ourselves, Bernard and myself, we want to crash. We want to invite ourselves to another of your chats. God bless you. Well, thank you so much. And uh, that's just, just fantastic. You can, can crash in on our chats at any stage you like, and we'll, we'll try and keep them at a reasonable time of day for you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And I appreciate the help and support you gave me at times when I was in Jamaica as well. And also the hilarious phone calls we've had between times. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Give me a virtual mango. Oh, of course. <laughs> the plant came from India years ago. <laughs> so beautiful. Very much okay. Thank you. Okay then. So, um, Seth, I don't know, uh, George, I don't know if you want to say anything else. No, I just want to once again express appreciation uh, to you and to the team that um, came together in order to explore, uh, you know, and to do these discussions. I, I think it is a necessary a journey we must take uh, because there has to be a point in time when we come to, you know, full realization because the world uh, prides itself upon, you know, we are living in an information age. We are talking about, you know, civilization. You know, we are at the peak of our civilization and so on. I think those things are questionable when the absence of very fundamental basic information having to do with, you know, a portion of humanity is so um, sad, it's, 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 it is uh, so um, missing. So uh, I, I really think that this is a worthwhile effort. It will not be a one day, one year uh, event, but by, you know, there's this saying, it's a constant dripping of the water that pierces the stone. If you never give up, uh, you certainly, they will achieve your objectives. So please keep up the good work, Liz. I really, really want to congratulate you. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Well, thank you to all of you and uh, lots of claps, lots of waves. So thank you very much to our speakers today. This was an excellent session. Um,
thank you to you, Jamaican High Commissioner, His Excellency Seth George Ramakan. Many, many thanks and good wishes to your uh, wife, uh, Dr. Lola well. Ramakan, who is just launching a really good book, which may be helpful and useful with a, as a curriculum resource. Thank you, Professor Charlotte Williams. I'm really homesick. I would, I would love to be emails with you. And thank you, Professor Robert Burroughs. You've been so kind and uh, thoughtful in our discussions in preparing for this session. And we know you're our friend in Colwyn Bay, and we will, we will stick with you. A very, very special thank you to the invisible Simon Faringo, who's uh, one of the, the team, three of us came up with this bright idea when we learned how to Zoom. So brilliant, Simon. Um, and also David Alston, who isn't able to be with us today, but his work on the Highlands and slavery is also going to be published this year. And it's fascinating. So really, really big thank you as well to, uh, to, to Caroline, uh, Caroline Sanson, who, <laughs> who remains very quiet very often, but is always there to, to support the sessions. Caroline's one of the directors of Learning Links International, and she's, been, she's a great support. Thank you, Cora. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Salama, too. Thank you, Gwyneth. Thank you, Grace, for joining us for the first time. We look forward to uh, more sessions, and now you're I know you're based in... Um, in Bangor. Thank you, Neil. It's great that you were able to come along. Thank you, Martin. And a special thank you to Jean Williams. Jean, it's lovely that you were able to be here uh, as a guest of ours as well. And we look forward to that. And did I say Chris Campbell? No, I didn't. How could I forget you, Chris Campbell? Who else have I forgotten? Anyway, thanks ever so much, everyone. And we'll finish the recording now and then we can have a natter afterwards. All right.